Campobello Island, Canada, August 9, 1921. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is 39 years old and in excellent health, but it's been an intense few years. Last November, he'd run for vice president and lost by a historic margin, and now he's wrapped up in a scandal from his time as assistant secretary of the Navy. He really needs to get away from it all. So after a social appearance marching with the scouts at the Boy Scout Jamboree, he took his family to their favorite vacation spot. Now, he's attacking his leisure time with determination. Sailing, long hikes, clearing brush, swimming in frigid water. But one night, he starts to feel wrong. He has nausea, fever, and chills. His skin is so sensitive he can't wear clothing, and a spreading numbness engulfs his legs. A few days later, he gets the diagnosis. Roosevelt has the most feared disease in America, poliomyelitis, and he will never walk without assistance again. This episode is sponsored by the Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota. As a young adult, it's important to monitor your health, even when you don't feel sick, and you may qualify for free annual checkups. Learn more at u21checkups.com. Poliomyelitis, often shortened to polio, has been with humanity for thousands of years. Even carvings and paintings from ancient Egypt show otherwise healthy people with weakened limbs and dropped feet, common in the disease. Entering via the mouth, the polio virus colonizes the gastrointestinal tract to reproduce itself. Most patients develop flu-like symptoms, but in 1% of cases, the disease spreads to the central nervous system, inflaming parts of the brainstem, spinal cord, or motor cortex of the brain. When it does, this paralytic polio has the potential to destroy the motor neurons, paralyzing the patient, or even cut signals to the throat and diaphragm, leaving them unable to breathe. But even so, for most of history, nobody noticed polio much. There were cases, of course, which caused terrible suffering, but historically, it was just a case here or there. That is, until the early 1900s, when both Europe and the United States suddenly had a rash of polio epidemics. The illness raged during the summer, infecting dozens or hundreds in each city. Polio paralyzed 15,000 people per year, leaving previously healthy patients unable to walk without crutches or bound to wheelchairs. After 1928, patients who lost their ability to breathe could only survive inside of a device known as an iron lung, a motorized airtight tank that was the precursor to the modern ventilator. And worst of all, polio primarily affected children. It was the most feared disease in the United States. Polio outbreaks meant closed pools and movie theaters, canceled school classes, and public health authorities hanging quarantine signs on homes of those unlucky enough to catch it. New York healthcare workers would pull children out of classrooms or playgrounds when they had symptoms and isolate them away from parents. Case numbers were breathlessly reported to the public via newspapers and radio on a daily basis. It was terrifying because it was so mysterious. Polio came out of nowhere and didn't behave like any epidemic disease 20th century Americans were at all used to. Early attempts to blame it on immigrants fell apart when New York doctors noticed there were actually fewer cases in immigrant neighborhoods, despite their dense population and lower access to sanitation. In fact, it struck hardest in the more modern middle class and wealthy neighborhoods. For decades, doctors and the makers of consumer products had promised that cleanliness was the key to health. Yet children were coming down with polio despite the fact that they bathed regularly, washed their hands, played on sanitized floors, and used products that were sold wrapped in cellophane to keep them clean. Except it turns out that cleanliness was the problem. See, it's not that few people were getting polio before the 20th century. It was that everyone was getting polio before the 20th century. Because polio virus is spread through the fecal-oral route, most people would get it as infants. And while the polio virus is not that dangerous for infants, the older you are, the worse it is. Which is why it struck the 39-year-old Franklin Roosevelt so hard. And yet FDR's infection would be a major turning point in the war against the disease. After getting some benefit from physiotherapy at a hot spring in Georgia, Roosevelt purchased it in 1926. And the next year turned it into the Warm Springs Foundation, a free rehabilitation center for polio victims. And he left the day-to-day -day operations to his close friend and legal partner, Basil O'Connor. The move turned him from one of the most famous sufferers of the disease to its most prominent philanthropist and advocate. Now, there are a lot of myths about FDR and polio. In fact, he may not have even had polio at all, as some historians believed he actually had an autoimmune disease. But by far the biggest myth 
is that Roosevelt hid from the public the fact that he had polio, and that there was a gentleman's agreement with the press to conceal his condition. But in fact, it was widely known that Roosevelt had recovered from polio. What he actually concealed was the extent of his disability. His public appearances as governor of New York, and later as president of the United States, were carefully stage-managed to avoid him being seen in a wheelchair. He walked on stage with the aid of leg braces, a cane, and his bodyguard, and made speeches while holding onto railings or podiums, gesturing with his head so his hands could stay planted. And if the press did photograph him while he was in his wheelchair, Secret Service agents would bounce on them and destroy their film. Though even so, Life magazine, owned by a magnate who opposed Roosevelt's policies, did publish a tabloid-style photo of the president in his wheelchair. Publicly, Roosevelt used his image as a polio survivor as part of his public relations, using it as proof of his bravery and toughness. Also, he used his position as president to fundraise for a cure. Every year, local chapters of the Warm Springs Foundation held charity dances on Roosevelt's birthday that supported treatment programs. By the 1930s, medical researchers were already in hot pursuit of a polio vaccine, but had failed. Initial errors such as choosing the wrong species of monkey as a test subject and misunderstanding the method of transmission slowed progress. Meanwhile, annual outbreaks continued to rage. In 1935, President Roosevelt canceled one of his favorite events, the Boy Scout Jamboree, to prevent spreading the virus to the 25,000 young boys scheduled to attend. He personally made the announcement via radio. And in 1938, Roosevelt decided to throw his weight as president behind the vaccine effort. He reorganized the Warm Springs Foundation into the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis with the goal to raise money for polio treatment and vaccine research. And O'Connor had a new concept to match this new organization. See, traditionally at this point in history, American philanthropy rested on large donations from the wealthy. But O'Connor wanted to change that. Instead, they would use celebrity talent and get the public personally behind the search for a vaccine. Everyone would contribute a little. The word went out on a coast-to-coast -coast radio broadcast. Broadway and film star Eddie Cantor called for Americans to drop spare change in envelopes and send them to Washington. If every child in America gave 10 cents, he said, they could further the cause for polio treatment and research and create a march of dimes all the way to the White House. The response overwhelmed them. During the past few days, Roosevelt said during a birthday radio broadcast, bags of mail have been coming, literally by the truckload to the White House. Yesterday, between 40 and 50,000 letters came. Today, even a greater number. How many, I cannot tell you, for we only estimate the actual count by counting the mailbags. In fact, it was so many times, the Foundation had to estimate their value by shoveling loads onto a scale which they finally tallied at $18 million. The implications on the world of medical philanthropy were enormous. The March of Dimes, now an annual event, would change charitable giving in the United States, trailblazing a new small donation model that over the next three decades gave half a billion dollars to polio research. In 1952, when the NFIP-funded virologist Jonas Salk conducted a promising vaccine trial using killed polio virus, the organization stepped up to fund and manage a wider trial with 1.8 million children. Risky. But it worked. And in 1955, the Salk vaccine was declared safe for use, and it would be kept cheap. Because when asked by an interviewer who would own the patent for the vaccine, Salk responded, Who owns the patent? Well, the people, I would say. There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? Now more could be said about Salk, including his bitter rivalry with Albert Sabin, who developed a live oral vaccine, but ultimately, both vaccines, each useful for different reasons, were funded by the March of Dimes, which continued after Roosevelt's death in 1945. And to celebrate his contribution to public health, FDR got the perfect tribute. On Roosevelt's birthday in 1946, the U.S. Treasury put his face on the dime, and it's been there ever since. Once again, thanks so much to Child and Teen Checkups Program for sponsoring this episode. Remember, we're all at our best when we stay in charge of our own health. And even as a young adult, it's important to get annual checkups because they're a great and proactive way of identifying symptoms, addressing concerns, and setting a baseline for a happy, healthy future. Plus, you may qualify for free annual checkups. You can learn more and get started today at u21checkups.com. That's the letter U, 21, checkups.com. 
Oh, I didn't see you there. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muster, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Oriel's One. It's so nice I can thank you all in one place.